Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I found Jesus in every book in here. He, the Messiah that we've been waiting for is here. He, he's all over the book. I want to share a scripture with you, well, actually two, and uh, the Romans 14, 12, and John 3, 18. Now, Romans 14, 12 says that every man, whether he's a believer or not, every man will stand before God and give an answer and an account of his life when judgment day comes. And I'm saying that more for people perhaps watching by television or maybe some in here who have not yet made a commitment to serve God. Someday you're going to have to face him. Whether you believe that he's real or not, I can tell you that he is. And I would just think like this if I were you. I mean, if I'm wrong, if I think God exists and I live my whole life doing what I'm doing and I come to the end of it and I find out, whoops, no God. I mean, I really haven't lost anything. I still had a great ride. But if you believe God doesn't exist and you don't serve him and you get to the end of your life and oops, there's God. <laughs> You're going to be much sorrier than I would be if I found out I was wrong. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Now, this is a pretty simple way to put it, but if I were you, I just wouldn't take a chance on weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> and boy, I know, nobody wants to talk about hell anymore. Well, can I tell you something? God talked about hell. I mean, Jesus talked about hell more than he did heaven. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Yeah. He talked about it a lot. And you know, we, we tell people all the time, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, and that is absolutely true. But let me tell you something, we can't just do nothing but teach to people about the goodness of God and not share with them what's on the other side if they don't make right decisions now. And see, you would have clapped louder if I would have said, God loves everybody and he's merciful and forgiving and kind. And man, see, you're already like, ah. and he is, he is, he's all those things. But the Bible says, if the righteous are barely saved, <laughs> what in the world is going to happen to the unrighteous? And so, you know, I don't, I don't normally take a whole message and just turn it into an evangelistic message, but I felt really strongly tonight that in addition to helping us to know who God is, that I just want to say to people around the world, we don't know how much time we have. And please open up your heart to God and learn to know who he really is because you will never be sorry if you do. I mean, I have no idea what I would do without God. Now, the good news is, in John 3, 18, that those of us who are saved, who have received Christ as our Savior, the Bible says, he who believes in him. How many of you believe in him? Awesome. He who believes in him, who clings to, trusts in, and relies on him. You see, that's what a real believer does. They cling to, trust in, and rely on him, is not judged. He who trusts in him never comes up for judgment. That judgment day is going to be totally different for us. We're not going to be judged regarding salvation because we already believe and that's all secured for us by the grace of God. There will come a time when every man will be judged for their works and given rewards accordingly. That's a different time. And I per personally, when I get there, don't still want to be in kindergarten. I want to be like a college professor or something. I want to be, you know, way up the line up there. This is so comforting. For him, there is no rejection. 
You can never be rejected if you're a believer. There is no condemnation. He incurs no damnation. But he who does not believe, cleave to, rely on, and trust in him is judged already. <laughs> he has already been convicted and has already received sentence because he has not believed and entrusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He is, re he is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Jesus Christ. What are you going to put your trust in these days? The bank? Uh, your retirement fund? Your 403B? Your 401K? Your friends? <laughs> Yourself? That's not very stable either. Amen? And I'm not trying to be insulting. I mean, I can't put my trust in myself because sometimes I do things that shock even me. <laughs> do you ever just like, I can't believe I did that. I cannot believe I said that. I cannot believe I acted like that. I cannot believe I did that. So I've learned that I can't even really fully trust me. We have to put our trust in the name of God. Don't put your trust in the bank account. Put your trust in God. Now, I am that I am. He's without beginning and without end. God wasn't born and he can't die. He had no parents. He's it. The all-powerful one who depends on nothing and no one, he is self-sufficient. When Jesus came walking to the disciples on the sea, they were frightened. They were out in a boat out in the middle of the sea, and he came walking on the water. Ah, they thought it was a ghost. And his answer to them was, why are you afraid I am? I love that. Any time that fear comes against you, stop for a moment and say, he's here. He's here. When you wake up in the morning before you ever put your feet on the floor, take just a moment and say, he's here. He's with me right now. And he's everything that I need all day long. I am is here. I'm not going to preach you a message tonight about what you should do and what you shouldn't do, and those are all good too, and they're for another time. But tonight I want to help you know who he is and that he is for you and not against you, that he loves you and he's got a good plan for your life, and there's nothing wrong in your life that he is not delighted to fix. The Bible says that all things consist in him and are held together by him. What in the world is holding this world that is so messed up together. I would think that it would just blow apart from the stress, but God is holding everything together. Who keeps the sun in the sky? What keeps it from falling down and burning us up? What keeps it from being, getting too hot one day and just giving us all a suntan way beyond what we could endure? <laughs> think about it. How is this thing all running and staying together? To me, there's got to be something. Up. It would take more faith to be an atheist than to be a Christian. I mean, I would need a lot of faith for that. Man, I tell you, when you can just cozy up with God, say, thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for living in me. Thank you for loving me, for forgiving me, for being my friend. Then you can go out of your house and you can believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God enables us to have a peace that passes understanding. And even when we are unable to help ourselves in our own problems, he will still anoint us to reach out beyond ourselves and help somebody else. And then God brings a harvest in our lives by then helping us with our problems. That's why it's so foolish to spend all your time trying to fix yourself. And then I love Hebrews 1.3. He maintains upholds and propels the universe. Wow. Well, you know, it's not just, gra well, I mean, well, gravity does this. Well, where did gravity come from? A Russian astronaut went to space, looked out his window, and supported his atheistic view by saying, God cannot be real because we cannot see him. Yet this same man believes in gravity, which cannot be seen either. 
I don't see electricity, but I'm sure making use of it. I don't understand all the mechanism of breathing, but I'm partaking right now. Amen? And just because you can't see God, if you would open your eyes and just have a little bit of childlike faith, you could begin to see him everywhere you go. I see God every spring when everything that was stone dead, not a leaf, not a bit of life in it anywhere, and all of a sudden in just like a week or two, everything's flowers and blooming and leaves and green. Oh, well, that's just nature. <laughs> Yeah, well, where did that come from? You can't back up far enough to not finally have to run into God. <laughs> In the beginning, God. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And guess what? He is everything in between. And he is our God. I love what the Bible says. This God is our God. He is your God. He's just not some God. He is our God. How could you not want to know this God that I'm talking about? How could anybody not be excited about knowing him? I don't know. Yeah, you better pray for me to be able to stay on the earth this weekend. I'm pretty excited. God is a mystery. He cannot be figured out. You can't see him, but you can see the result of his work everywhere. He's the God that parted the Red Sea. He's the God that brought manna in the wilderness day after day after day. It rained bread out of heaven. He's the God who fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. I see God all the time when all the bills are consistently paid at Joyce Meyer Ministries and they're higher than I even know how to count. I have no idea how I'm doing what I'm doing. So I have to say, it's gotta be God. <laughs> It couldn't possibly be anything else. Oral Roberts, who's gone home to be with the Lord, did a sermon and wrote a book many years ago called Don't Give Up, and in it he talked about who is this fourth man in the fiery furnace. And if you're familiar with the book of Daniel, you know that Daniel was thrown into a fiery furnace because, I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace because they refused to bow down and worship the wicked king. God tells us to worship him and him alone and not to bow to any other. And the king said, if you don't bow to me, instead of this God that you serve, then I am gonna throw you into this fiery furnace. And so they refused to bow and sure enough, he threw them into the fiery furnace and the Bible says that he even turned it up seven times hotter than it was before, which I find interesting because they made the right decision, which was not to compromise. And sometimes when you do the right thing, you feel like the furnace got turned up even hotter. And so then you're like, well, I sure don't understand this. I did the right thing and now look. I know years ago when I felt like God was calling me into ministry and I had a full-time job and Dave had a full-time job and we didn't really have any money struggles. We had learned how to tithe. Dave was taught that when he was growing up and we'd always been doing that. And you know, we just, we didn't have any money struggles. And when God started dealing with me about quitting my job, because I had no time, I didn't know anything. God was calling me to teach and I didn't know anything and I had three kids, I couldn't take off and go to Bible college, so I needed to study. I felt like God calling me to arrange my life in such a way where I could study and learn something. I had learned enough of the word to see that there were answers in there for every problem that we have and I needed time to dig them out. And so I felt that God was telling me to quit my job and so I kinda did a, not obedience, but a sacrifice thing. I quit my job and got a part-time job. And I look back now and I think it's so funny because I offered God part-time obedience, partial obedience. And you know what? God is never gonna be satisfied with that. So I was a good employee. I worked hard. I usually got promoted. Everybody liked me. I got my part-time job and got fired. I mean, it was supernaturally bad. I mean, everything that I touched, I tore it up. I broke the bookkeeping machine. I mean, just it was just like a nightmare. Well, it didn't take long, and I'm 
figuring out God really does not want me to work. <laughs> but I didn't know how in the world that we were gonna pay our bills. I just couldn't figure out how we were gonna do that. And so I thought, well, surely after I make this sacrifice, come on now, surely when I make this sacrifice, then God's gonna do some miraculous thing in our finances and we will have more than ever. God is gonna reward me for my obedience. Anybody here tonight? And for six years, every month we had to have a miracle. I was so scared half the time my knees would shake when I would go to the mailbox. We never had to pay a bill late. Every time God came through, but I tell you, I was, as they say, sweating bullets all the time. And I don't know how you do that, but that's a saying, so we'll just use it. In other words, I was very frightened. I, I got most of my kids' clothes and things that we needed at garage sales, and I became a coupon queen. I mean, I was clipping coupons and using coupons all the time. And to be honest, I got really tired of never having enough of anything, and I was like, why, God, why? I don't understand. I did what you told me to do, and we're in worse shape than ever before. Anybody relate? The furnace got turned off seven times hotter, but I made a decision that I was not gonna go back, that I was gonna stick with it and see what God would do. And I remember making a commitment, if you never, if nothing ever changes, we're still gonna tithe and give to you and do what you've asked us to do. And then of course, eventually things got taken care of. Well, the furnace was turned up seven times hotter than before. And when the king looked in there, he said, wait a minute, we put three men in that furnace and they were all tied up, they were bound, and now I see four men in there and they're all loose. And I love that part, they, they were actually loosed from their bondage in the furnace. Come on, can you hear me tonight? It was in the furnace that they got free from their bondage. But who is the fourth man? Well, he was Jesus. And so what Oral Roberts did, probably one of the greater things that he did, and I, I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it's about three pages long. I'm sure I'd put you to sleep, but he went through every book in the Bible and he found Jesus in every single book in the Bible. And the thing that's so amazing, we have a testimony, and I probably should have had him dug it out and played it for you tonight, but. It was, it's a testimony of a Jewish man who went into a bookstore and he saw my, he, he knocked some, a table of books over and when he picked it up, it was one of my books. And he kind of smirked and you know, opened it up and the place he opened it up to said, if you're reading this book today, it's because the God who loves you has a message for you and a plan for your life. Well, he snuck the book home because he didn't want his Jewish wife to know that he was reading it. And he began to read the book. Well, he got so touched, that, and he noticed I was quoting the Amplified Bible all the time, that he went and he bought an Amplified Bible. And he snuck that Bible in the house, and he's secretly reading it, and then he caught his wife one day who was also secretly reading <laughs> the Bible. And long story short, his testimony says, I found Jesus in every book in here. He, the Messiah that we've been waiting for is here. He, he's all over the book. And you know what? The God that many people today are looking for and deciding not to believe in because they don't see him doing what they want him to do, they need to start looking for what God is doing and stop murmuring about what he's not doing. You know, when I first got up this morning, I had a headache and you're sometimes so tempted to complain about what you have, but I thought, wait a minute, I can walk. We need to be thankful for what we do have and stop murmuring all the time about what we don't have because what we do have is so much greater than what we don't have. And if we had nothing else, we have him. So anyway, who is the fourth man? In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. 
In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Who was that following them around in the wilderness? Was it just a cloud and a fiery pillow? No, it was God following them around. And who is it that follows you around? Who is it that saves you from so many things that could happen that don't happen to you? God is with you. He has promised to never leave you nor forsake you, and he will take care of you. And even the things that do sneak through and happen, he can work good out of those things if you continue to trust him. Come on. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he's our lover and our bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's our righteousness. And boy, then when you get over to the New Testament, it really gets good. In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the Holy Spirit. In Romans, he is our justifier. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he is the gifts of the Spirit. In Galatians, he is our redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he is the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he's the God who supplies all of our needs. In Colossians, he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he is our soon coming king. In 1st in 2 Timothy, he is our mediator between God and man. In Titus, he is our faithful pastor. In Philemon, he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Got a few left. Can you take it? In Hebrew. <laughs> Come on, who is God? Who is this God that we serve? In Hebrews, he is the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he is our great physician, for the prayer of faith shall save the sick. In First and Second Peter, he is our chief shepherd, who shall appear with a crown of unfailing glory. In First, Second, and Third John, he is love. In Jude, he is the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. And in Revelation, he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Someone give God praise. the Hand of Hope Medical Clinic in Angacha, Ethiopia. And Dave, I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you feeling as you come here and see the work that God's allowing us to do? Uh, I'm feeling humbled. I'm feeling thrilled, excited about what God's given us an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, when, when I look at this place, it was a rundown wreck at one time, and now it's so beautiful. The grounds are uh, actually, they say they're therapeutic to the people here, yeah, right. and uh, the people are excited about what, what has happened here, but we're excited about what God is doing, how he's helping the people here in the Mangacha, Ethiopia. We have the opportunity to yeah. help hurting people, and that's our goal, that's our desire, that's our hunger for, for Joyce Meyer Ministry. Well, one thing's for sure, we certainly love helping people and to see the smiles on the kids' faces and and to see the hope in their parents' eyes is just a, a phenomenal blessing. I can honestly say, I don't think that there's anything in the world that's better or gives you a better feeling than knowing that you're making a positive difference in somebody else's life. I love to be able to put a smile on someone's face. Thank you for helping us do that. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash partner. Vind je het moeilijk om te bidden? Te ingewikkeld? Bidden kan zoiets moois zijn. Praat met God eenvoudig over alles. Een boek van Joyce Meyer kan jou hierbij helpen. De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed. 
Leer hoe je met God over alles kunt praten. Je kunt het boek De Kracht van een Eenvoudig Gebed nu bestellen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch op 026 20 22 100.